Let's call on John Dunbar. Would you leave us in prayer, please, John? Thank you. <clears throat> Father, we just want to praise your name tonight. Thank you for another week, Father. Thank you for the Sabbath coming very shortly. Thank you for Jesus Christ, Father. We thank you for your great love, Father, and your willingness to send him here to die and be resurrected so we can have eternal life. Tonight, as we dig into Romans, Father, give us those insights and understanding of the world. Give us the desire to have a better life in Jesus Christ. We ask in the name of your Son. Amen. 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 Okay, what about a little review to see whether one day's absence from the rigorous regimen that we've had you in has made any difference to your retention factor. The three great words of verse 1, 1, 1, remember, Father. One servant, apostle, gospel, the key to the whole book of Romans is the first verse, first verse, a bond servant, one who is purchased by a master and then set free, so he willingly devotes himself to the service of that master forever, magnificent term and is then sent forth as an apostle bearing good news. And we discover that the good news is not the story of a loving God. The good news is Jesus Christ himself. He is the good news. Absolutely. Then the theme was developed in Romans 1 verses 3 through 6. And a splendid development it is, because something sequential was spelled out to us in chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Who recalls that sequential development? Rudy? Okay, the birth, the holy life, the baptism, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. The birth, the holy life, the baptism, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The expansion of of the whole theme of Romans is simply a recounting of the whole life and death of Jesus Christ. From his incredible incarnation to his death and glorious resurrection. This is Romans in a nutshell. And then in chapter 1 there is a third expansion of the theme which in the eyes of many is the most profound of all. What verses are they? 16 and 17 and a most unique contribution now emerges to our understanding of the theme when Paul declares, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because Mike, and what are you hearing when it says the power or the dunamis of God? What God's power is incarnate, dwelling within us, it's His power. Yes, the gospel is actually God incarnate in human flesh. And that means if you embrace the gospel, you are so convicted by the death of Jesus Christ as a love offering from God that you will willingly give God the privilege Thank you, Mike, of dwelling in you through the Holy Spirit. And when a holy God dwells in sinful human flesh, what is the result? Let me rephrase that. What should be the result? Victory over sin. Victory over sin, yes. A reflection of his character. The very holiness of God is on the line here. That's just going to say a holy life. A holy, yes, a holy life. Yes. 
And if a holy life is not forthcoming, and sinners continue loving sin while at the same time taking hold of the kingdom of God, what is being declared about God himself? He's a liar. Yes, he's a liar. He can't do what he says he can do. Exactly. Exactly. But, Bill, on that, on that particular area, wouldn't you, couldn't you qualify it a little bit and say that you cannot see evidence of spiritual growth? Because if you, if someone from the outside looks at somebody, that has moved into belief and is being filled by grace and God is working with them. It doesn't guarantee that they're perfect at the very beginning. And somebody from the outside of this. Do you want to rethink there, that particular statement? That last little statement? Well, of course, I think it's if somebody's on the outside looking. No, but that little okay. statement you just made about it doesn't guarantee that they're perfect. Well, they're perfect in God's sight. No question. They're perfect because they're covered by the robes of Jesus Christ. But what I mean, and that may well be the only perfection they will have. But you said if they continue sinning for that. No, I didn't say that. I deliberately did not say that. It's so very important now. We've thrashed this out here. Very important. The one thing that they do have from the beginning is what? Perfection. They have perfection in Jesus Christ from the beginning. They are saved from having to spend their lives trying to obtain perfection. And with that in place, what are they now free to permit God to bring about? I mean, this is the promise of the gospel. To grow the problem is how people interpret the terms. You know, you can say one thing and a person can hear something else with a very same term. But the one thing that we have spelled out on how many times here biblically is that perfection and sanctification are not synonymous. And the Apostle himself makes a clear and bold statement about that. Perfection is not sanctification. And when you're talking perfection, you need to think carefully with whom you are comparing yourself. That's why human beings will never be heard to utter those words regarding themselves, but they will claim it in Christ. I think you've heard me say how frequently now Christianity is the only religion that begins with perfection and victory. Amen. Thus freeing up individuals to grow up into maturity and, and learning to permit God to bring that about within us, I guess we could say that is a lifelong challenge for all of us. Is it learning how to permit, permit God? Us? Yes. Because of the tendency we have once we move into faith to think that we're now becoming more self-sufficient each day. Well, that goes to the point that Jeff and I the greatest concept of what language related to the abiding and when was one of the available is obviously available at the outset. The, the thought came out that the process, but the difficulty is getting, is me believing what he's done. And that's, it's almost like to me, that's everything. And the reason I keep failing is I keep thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe he's not going to do this any better. As long as every time I go do it, he has to come back and say, oh, by the way, didn't you remember? I did this for you. So the process is me believing that so maybe it's possible, really, that sanctification is the process of learning to be justified every moment of your life. Instead of, because if you're doing that, you are looking at the cross rather than at some remarkable development that's taking place within you. And a lot of people, even though they begin with faith, end up in works because they see themselves as getting stronger as they go through the process. And I think this is what Jeff is, is, is trying to help us to see more clearly here, is that ultimately even that very growth that takes place within us, and Jeff, that statement that you shared with me the other night was so beautiful. Do you want to bring it, do you still recall it? Because that was a profound summary of what we've done. Share it with the whole room here tonight. I'm not sure which one. What about, one? The, the, the it's really the grace, yes. When, when I was listening to you, in the present 
presentation, it struck me that we couldn't have a situation where Christ's grace provided salvation, but still somehow we have something to do beyond acceptance. That if it was grace from the beginning, it had to be grace all the way through it. That each experience in our life is controlled and developed in Christ's grace. Jeff said the other night, it's like a continuous outpouring of the grace of God. I love that statement. Mm -hmm. Even the growth we experience is a continuous outpouring of the grace of God. But we do have to take hold of it and act upon it. But even our acting upon it is the grace of God being poured out. So you're never going to reach the point of saying, well, hallelujah, I'm now a God. Because as soon as you do that, what's going to happen? You will sink. You'll be like Peter on the water. You look around just for a moment. You'll start going under. Because the slightest self-reliance is sufficient to cause you to sink. And this is a fantastic statement Jeff came out with. It's the continuous outpouring of the grace of God throughout the whole growth and development of the Christian life. It's a beautiful statement. Ellen White said it so beautifully herself that it's like the two oars of a boat, imputed and imparted righteousness. They are both the righteousness of Jesus. In one, God graciously declares you to be something you are not, and in the other, he imparts to you his own holiness to grow you and develop you into his likeness. But at no point can you ever say, I have developed this. As soon as you say that, you will move aside from faith and you will be plunged into struggle. Can you feel that's the most misunderstood? Do you want to come up over here? I think we can squeeze you over here. I'm sorry. To me, that's the most misunderstood issue in the mm. wonderful message that I think Right. I agree. And this is what to me, it makes me so excited about the message that was entrusted to Adventism. This is the pure message. But we've muddied it a little. Yeah. And it doesn't always come through. And so we have a lot of people that are sincere in seeking God but feeling hopeless at the same time. Because they are faced painfully with the recognition no matter how hard they try, they will never be good. Or they jump though, and decide you know, I'm just going to trust totally I'm not going to do anything. Yep. Yeah, exactly. What's the use of even trying? You know? Yeah. The hopelessness prevails. Yeah, take care. Yeah. It seems to me that it would be good to clarify. Listen, please. The misunderstand, Jeff, misquoted you, and you said, I didn't say that. Yeah. Um, I think that's grounds that a lot of people get tripped up on and struggle with. Yeah. And it's one thing I am extremely sensitive to not saying because I realize if I made that statement how confused I would leave people in the process. And it's only painfully that I came to that awareness myself that that is not a statement that I could ever say because I don't believe it. It would be a denial of the fact that it is 100% the grace of God. Total denial of it. So we finished Romans 1, 16 and 17. Then we came to Romans 3, where the theme was picked up again, still summarizing. And in Romans 3, verse says, um, 3 through 5, wasn't it? Yes. Romans 3, 3 through 5, the theme developed further and a very profound. Karen, you look as though you have an unnatural degree of excitement here. Let's hear it. Well, this really has set in with me since we, I've thought about it often since, since we said this, that, that God is on trial here in verse 4. It's a great controversy. And what is so beautiful that our unrighteousness uh, demonstrates God's righteousness because when he incarnates us, he lives his holy life. 
and which overcomes our unrighteousness. And they see, now the universe sees, through us, by examining us, what God is like. That he lives his life differently to us than we live our life. Excellent, excellent. What a profound thing that is to see this. Huh? Paul actually has a much greater grasp of the great controversy than we might realize. He actually sees God being a focus in judgment. And we had a profound discussion on this with the last thing we did. Who recalls that discussion? Because something came through regarding the investigative judgment, which I think could bring a lot of peace to many Seventh-day Adventists who basically become disillusioned because of their understanding or misunderstanding of the, the investigative judgment. What profound thought came through, Linda? Yes, but that's, that's really the surface thing. Something really profound came through the other night. Karen's just made that point. But this is something really the rationale behind that which came out in the discussion the other night. That God is, is, is true. That He is worthy of worship. He is holy because by examining us, He is, as a body, His character is being vindicated. Because our unrighteousness now incarnate God is living a holy God has overcome. Now we agonize over this the other night, and if you want to keep me in a state of hypertension, <laughs> he's just vindicated. Agonized it all over again. That'll do it. We really wrestled with this the other night until it came out. And I kept it took half an hour for this point to come out the other night. And obviously we need to redo it by the look of it. But this is a very serious point. And the rationale behind the focus on God in judgment actually came through. Linda? I hope I have it. We, choose, we all hope, Linda. We choose our own judgment for ourselves. It's our choice. We can, ex we can accept God and his atonement. Or we can reject him because of the scriptures in um, chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, I believe. It talks about... Blood pressure is rising. It shows, okay, it shows that that we choose unrighteousness. We choose death knowingly. If you're knowing talking that about us, you can be sure you're not on the issue. Yet. Pardon? If you're talking about us, you can be sure the issue is not coming out. Well, God's character is vindicated. How? By imputing his life in us. Pardon? His righteousness. Come on now. Come on, there's something that must emerge here. This is the point we agonized on the other. You weren't here, so we'll... Oh, give me a chance. Just hold on, we'll move on. It's more important for me to talk to those who were here so I can see if they are retaining, Mike. Um, one thing that, that I remember is that you have a holy God that is incarnate in sinful man and His righteousness is shown through changing the sin. Not the sinner, but changing the sin, eliminating the sin, and living the holy life within us in a sinful vessel. And I know there's more to it, but I can't. Come on, Mike, don't leave us there. That's a very good introductory statement. Excellent. So, how does that vindicate God? Paul, are you jumping in there? Yeah, this is certainly a result. And how I'm looking for the rationale behind it, the same point I labored over almost to the point of exhaustion the other night. I can't recall. Dennis? Uh, as I recall, the, um, Satan has been saying all along that God's law is impossible to be kept. Yeah. Yeah. And by Him incarnating our lives and allowing and giving us sinless, then it shows to the world that yes, God's law is righteous, is just. Okay, that's an excellent statement. You may have just left out one very important development regarding Jesus himself. 
you've kind of made a leap from here to here and left out perhaps a very important interim step. Do you want to put it in? Absolutely. Uh, Jesus already did this. Come on, did what, Dennis? He Tell already us. led the sinless life in human flesh. Okay, so and Jesus, in becoming human and taking on the likeness of sinful human flesh, did what? Come on, spell it out to us. He lived the holy life. Now, make a little transition now. And when he incarnates us, it will be him in sinful flesh again. And again, um, there is one little profound thought that would be most helpful, Dennis. We're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit now. So when the Holy Spirit is given, what is he actually engaging in doing? Restoration. Come on, Dave. Bypass the step you just so beautifully put in now. It's not a new work beginning all over again. Jesus has already, you just said it, in human flesh, overcome sin and the devil. Come on, Dennis, make the bridge for us. He has already overcome. He did. So tell me something now about the victorious Christian life and faith. I don't want to see Jeff jumping up and down on an unnatural degree of excitement because this is the very issue that he raised previously and I don't want to fall into it here. <laughs> That is the ministry 
of the Holy Spirit. It's a world of difference from me getting strong enough to do it. It has already happened in Him. That's why surrender instead of struggle is the secret of victory. So the world, every time a sinner is converted and dies to the world, The sinner takes on first the death and then the resurrection of Jesus. But so many fatally, it's like I heard a very well-known preacher say the other day, you can become all you want to become. You can reach it, you can do it, you can be it. And I shattered. Stay with me. That's a humanistic theology. It's Jesus who became everything and his entire experience, his death to self, his overcoming the devil, his victory over sin is all mine by faith. And Romans is going to spell it out beginning with this chapter. Want to know this is all review as to where we are up till now. Are we all sailing in the same ship? Or have some of you jumped into a life raft and you're floundering out there in the ocean? Huh? Can you say the whole thing again? You're at my shame, Roy. I'm not sure about that. It's going, to, it's going to come through again. Paul is extremely repetitive, but this is a summary of a whole week we've just spent together. By the way, a week that I feel has gone down in the annals of heaven as a remarkable week here in Costa Mesa. Yes. What an outpouring of God's Spirit we've seen this week. Repentance, confession, healing, it's all been here. Very exciting. And we're not done yet. Who knows what yet? awaits us this coming week. Alright, please turn to Romans 3. Sorry to begin on such a negative note here, but there's a description of the true nature of man in his natural state. It'll never be the same again after you've read it. Pull your group together so you know with whom you are communicating. There's too many at your table, divide into two groups. Lynn, can we get you over here with Alice so that uh, at least there's a chance of some communication there? Closer, closer. I'm waiting for you to divide up into groups so I can see with whom you are communicating. Don't have you back to anybody. Get your body language into the group. This table's too spread out for good communication, so either you squeeze up together or make two groups, one or the other. We've got two groups here. We've got two groups here, okay. How many groups have we got at this table? Just one? Okay. Only one here? Alright. Alright, listen carefully, listen carefully. We're looking at Romans 3 verses 10 through 18. I suggest you read it out loud in your little group, maybe taking it in turns to read the verses, because it's so profound. When you've read it, I'm going to give you just a few minutes to reflect upon how convicting this passage is. This is man in his natural condition, apart from God. Listen carefully. I was just giving you a little opportunity here to look in the mirror. Thank you. Because this is the mirror of human existence. This is the dark mirror of man's natural state apart from God. And I hope you can see why there would never 
be a time where man would be in a position to boast of his own accomplishments. Because apart from God, what a dark picture is painted here. Was there any particular part of this description that made a significant impact upon you? That's what I'm hoping you just focused in on there with the freedom I gave you. Katie, was there something there that struck you? Yeah, uh, all these uh, things that it says is very, it's very bad how we are. Was there anything specific there in the description that really impressed you with its um, seriousness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd love you to zero in on one thing. That would be great. I'm looking for specifics now. Listen carefully. Listen, hang on, we haven't got attention yet. Thank you. No one is uh, righteous. Okay, no one is righteous, not even no. one, yes, no one. not even one. A very healthy understanding for anyone seeking righteousness, huh? Because of the temptation to look for it where? Ourselves. Within ourselves, yes, you'll never find it. No matter how hard you look, you will never find it within yourself. That's a very very significant thing to focus in on, Dennis. Maybe think about Paul is also it's the way he phrases, the way he puts certain words in there. Okay. Um, and I love the statement: "There is none who understands; there is none who seeks for God." He didn't even say seeks God. There is none who even seeks for Him. They don't even. What does that say, Dennis? I mean, we're well, reading it in another track. No one is even searching. Nobody seeks, nobody even wants there to be a God. So man isn't even capable of, of, that. of looking for God. <laughs> yeah, that is so, so true. And yet so many religions have gone And yet so many religions of the world are based upon a way of finding God through various and sundry activities. You know, I sat in a little Buddhist temple once in India just for fun to see what it would be like. I sat cross-legged for half a day on a mat in this quaint little Buddhist temple and there was a saffron-robed, shaven-headed monk sitting next to me and he had in front of him a little pile of seeds, tiny little seeds, and he spent the entire day taking one seed at a time and transferring it to another pile. And these were tiny little seeds. And in the half a day that I sat there, he was only part way through this little mountain of seeds. And he explained to me that as he did this, each time he took another seed, he thought of something desirable about the God that he was trying to find. And by the end of the day, hopefully, he would have such a picture of this God. That, and I just felt so sorry for him, you know? And I began to think to myself of how we have access through Christ into the holiest of holies, right into the presence of God himself by faith. We can go right into the presence of the supreme being of the universe. And here he was trying to get close to this God by doing this all day long, you know. Which means pay attention. 
what is, is the shepherd is looking for a sheep. What we have to do is pay attention. That's the word, you know, because I think all the pagan religions show that they're seeking for God and God is always hiding in places, you know, up in the right. mountain, like in the Fujijama or it's the not mountain. That approachable. The Mount Olympus. You have to look easy and look That's up. right. They have to go and appease <laughs> God. That's the pagan religion. Yeah. The religion of the Christian is God looking for us. Yeah, but somehow that comes around and says, oh, we have to seek God, you know. That's pagan concept. Excellent. Yes, excellent. Christianity is a religion of God seeking. That's right. Amen. Man cannot by seeking to find out God. That's right. Beautiful. Uh, Jesus specifically says that in John 6, 44. He says, no one comes to me except the Father of God. Great principle to understand that. So I'm not doing God a favor in finding him. Because I would, in fact, in stating that, be denying a beautiful truth about God himself, that he has been inclined in drawing me unto himself. And that makes it, when we recognize that, we would become very humble. Yeah, yeah. We don't only have access to God because of what we've done, but because of what Well, maybe in that sense we are a part of that sense. Well, uh, I see a couple of things. Well, Speak up a little. Uh, from the uh, verse 10 to verse 17, I think it's a, relation, it's a relationship there. Uh, since none is righteous, and they're, you know, they're trying to find uh, uh, happiness for themselves, I guess, or themselves, they don't have any peace within themselves. So that peace is not there. And that's also uh, along what she said uh, about the shepherd and the sheep. Uh, the sheep are uh, skittish. And when the shepherd's not around them, they are very frightened. They have the confidence of the shepherd being right next to them. Yeah. And that's the, you know, that's the part of that. Sheep need leadership. Sheep need leadership. Right. I noticed when I was in Israel a few months ago that they used a goat to lead the sheep. The goats are stubborn and independent. And all the sheep would follow this one goat. I was fascinated. <laughs> Lynn? I heard somewhere, I don't remember where, but um, all of the worlds in the universe are this flock, and this earth is the lost sheep. Yeah. If it's the only fallen world, then that would, of course, be true. Is that the 91 looking for that one planet? Oh. Anything else in the passage that may have struck you? Please. Oh, sorry, I was looking at your friend, uh, first of all. Please introduce your friend to the body, too. That's friend Alan, visiting from Studio City. Yeah. 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 Uh, Alan Lewis, Amen. Great. No, I was just thinking about what what uh, what he was saying about about uh, us not even knowing how to seek for God. It's almost like you have to pray and ask God to even give you the desire to seek Him. Because you don't want to seek him. Uh, and the sheep, yeah, exactly. And the sheep, it's it's just beautiful how it's being tied to the sheep and the shepherd. Because um, when you think about God, the way that I was raised in the African church, my father's a pastor in the Southern Adventist church, and it's like you have this lofty ideal of who God is. And a lot of times, if you're not living 100% right, you're afraid to approach him because you think, oh, his ways are not my ways. He's he's up there. He's you know, and it's it's all in how you look at God as either a friend or as kind of like a big mean. Mm. Kind of like. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. I like that. Yes. And you certainly do get your picture of God from your parents in those Absolutely. formative years, don't you? Yes. That's if you. I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but if you grow up in a Christian family, you certainly got a very strong picture of God right from the beginning. Indeed. It's interesting that he's talking to a mixture of Jews included, and he quotes from the Old Testament when he says that it's written, yeah. that none are righteous.
righteousness. We can get a group that's prided themselves on being righteous yes. and being separate. So, Gerald, in your humble opinion, what would constitute apostasy on the part of God's elect? Those who have been called to reveal him to the world around them, what would truly constitute apostasy and a loss, perhaps, of the privilege of retaining his blessing and the privilege of sharing him to the world at large? What is the root of true apostasy? It seems as, as humans where to assert any part of the process that only God can do. And if we were to claim ownership or claim... Tie it together with your earlier remark, please. That was a good statement. Your first statement. So on our part, if we claim that there's anything of ourselves that is righteous at all, even the part about seeking God, even that act of seeking, yeah. is... Mm. That's scary, isn't it? Even if I was to let slip pridefully, you know, that I'm, uh, I'm a little closer to God than you. Or I'm a little better than you because you're not worshipping God in a church that has as much light as my church does. Anything like this would actually be a denial of what we're reading here. You didn't catch his first statement? No. Oh, this was an excellent statement. Please, I want you to summarize it, so don't change one word, please. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and speak up a little so they can hear you over here. If as, if as believers we claim any part of the process of righteousness, even the part of seeking God, and we take ownership of that process, then that's the process that's taking away from what God's doing. Yeah. Carol is suggesting that if we give even the slightest impression to anybody else that we, within ourselves, have some righteousness, some goodness, that we have been capable of doing something even great for God. What a temptation that is. I hear people standing up testifying to this every day of my life. I'm almost scared to ask people to praise God. Because when they get up, they start praising themselves, giving God the credit, of course. But they tell me how much they're doing. And I say to them, you know, one of these days, someone's going to tell me how much God has done. Amen. Then I'll know you've moved into praise. But if you stand up and tell me how well you're doing, with help from God, of course, you're missing the whole point. We need to open our eyes and recognize that in ourselves there is no good thing. And the only one deserving of being praised is God. Amen. We shouldn't even need to tell how effective we've been, but simply and humbly to share how gracious God has been. I've got some friends who have a gift of giving. Well, luckily, they also have something to give. <laughs> and they're always giving to various and sundry charities and ministries. And they were sharing with me recently how they had given a substantial amount of money to some one of our radio television ministries. And they had received a letter back from this ministry saying, we, we would like to honor you people at a a banquet and they wrote a letter back to this ministry saying please send us our money back because we are totally offended that you would think us deserving of recognition we only want God to be glorified he's the one who's entrusted us with this means and I was so impressed with their attitude I said hallelujah what a refreshing development that is but the way of the world is to seek recognition. We've got to have recognition. I was at Andrews University recently. I noticed that 
We used to only put the names of people who who uh, contributed toward major building projects on buildings after they died, but now we're doing it for the living, I notice. And I just said to myself, well, this is not a great development. It's God who's to be glorified in this. If someone has the means to, to put up a whole building, it's God who should be given the glory. Amen. If they even have that means, you know. Anyone else responding to this passage, Mike? Anything in it that struck you? What, what struck me as we're just talking is, is the next verse. It says, we all have turned aside together and have become useless. You know, it indicates at one time they were useful. You have to be useful before you become useless. So if you go back to what they were seeking, none is seeking for God. If they're not seeking for God, then they're useless. God can't even use us. We're worthless. We, we're actually no worth until we realize that He is the only thing in our lives that's worth anything. Beautiful place. Amen. I think we can assume when God created man, He did have a useful purpose. What struck me in verse 12, there is none who does good. There is not even one. How many people I hear as I go about living in this planet Earth, people saying, oh, but he's a, he does good things. They're always praising. This person, even though they're not a Christian, they're really good because look at all the good things they do. But this said there's nobody that does good. Right. So it's a pretty heavy passage, isn't it? And this is the balance in Paul. He wants to make sure we are convicted of sin. Then Their throat is <coughs> open too. That's pretty strong statement about what we say against <coughs> death. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds a bit like James with what he says about the tongue, doesn't it? Like a fire. Yep. Alan? No, I was just going to say it's, it's, if, if no one is good, it's just it's real interesting watching how, just like she said, most of the time when you see people, they're nice, they're pleasant, they're mm -hmm. They're good. So, you know, when you read this, you're like, boy, there must be a lot <laughs> that we don't see. There must be a lot that we don't, you know. I keep reminding you all how contrasting this is to the self-esteem movement. Right. In Christianity, peace is obtained through an honest acknowledgement of your true condition. <clears throat> Not trying to pump yourself up into believing I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. So. What did you just say, peace is what? Peace is obtained by acknowledging your true condition. Not by trying to pump yourself up to believe I'm really okay. That struck me because Listen. Swami was saying earlier that the world has Listen. no concept. Hang on, we haven't got attention yet. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Slavia, when we were talking about this passage, she says that the world doesn't really recognize their need of God. But when you brought up the peace part, I never had any peace until I turned to the world. There is no peace within ourselves. Just searched and searched everywhere. Deception, death, I mean, what are we reading here? Deceit? I'm sorry? I was just going to say, when you have an awareness of your condition, you also don't want to judge your people. Yeah. Because you're going to be there. So again, I could bring the same question that I laid on Terrell. What is apostasy? When you move into the judgment seat and sit in condemnation on others, you've become God. Absolutely. We're warned against it so strongly. In fact, Paul is going to declare boldly that those who judge others, look at chapter 2. We skipped over chapter 2, but this is one verse we should not have skipped over. Chapter 2, verse 1. Donna, could you read that out for us? Okay. Therefore, you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice. <laughs> you who judge others, what are you guilty of? Same, same. same thing. Do you know how many times I have failed that? Over and over again. It's almost as though those who are practicing the same sin 
get a certain what's the word I need? Response. I don't know if it alleviates their own guilt to us and mitigates their own guilt a little by denouncing it in somebody else. Remember that story you told about that person who was mad at the person who had a movie? That was in my home church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. I'm still recovering from that. And, that person who and this was an elder in our church who wanted us to sacrifice our beautiful young pastor. This was the pastor. And then when I find out that this elder had actually been to the cinema and seen the very movie that he was sitting in judgment on, and someone else brought that movie into the pastor's house, he hadn't got it himself. <laughs> I thought, well, what hypocrisy this is. And it came out. But still, the body was too wimpy to do anything about it. Mm. Like There's such a lack of conviction in these matters. It really challenges our understanding of what true goodness is. Yeah. Because we think of ourselves as we're good and we're nice, and other people are. But basically, you know, most of what we do is for selfish reasons. Mm -hmm. Everything, Carol, apart from Christ. <laughs> Everything we do is tainted with selfishness, even our most splendid efforts, you know. I mean, at the time of Christ, they'd stand on the street corner showing how much they were giving to the poor and hoping to be noticed as they did it, you know. That's typical of humanity apart from Christ. I just want to um, reflect back on the Sabbath sermon of last week. We were talking about the centurion and the Jews that the yeah, leaders that came point. with him um, and said, oh yes, Jesus, do this for him because he's such a good man. He's helped us. He's helped us. Even built out church. church. <laughs> That's That's right. Right. And they're thinking of he themselves. Oh. That's right. They're thinking of themselves as good when really the only person in there that was good was the centurion. It was not for the reason that the Jews were saying at all. He felt themselves to be good. And well, they were even wanting to make out that he was good, but he was the one humble person in the life. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what made it good. Yes. It was faith. Nick? We, uh, when we raise our children, when they do good things, we tell them, you're a good boy, you're a good girl. I mean, we were brought up thinking this way, and then pretty soon you think you're capable of doing something good. Right. And, you know, when God says good and faithful servant, that's one thing. You know, there's something wrong with telling people I've done something good. But to think because I've done something good that there's something good about me is a whole different thing. But remember that those who sat on his right hand, Jesus said, you know, well done thou, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the kingdom prepared for thee. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me, and how did the sheep respond? When did we do all these things? Yes. When? Did when? Do Why do we do all when did we do all these things? That's pretty significant. Isn't it? But when he turned to the goats, remember, and he said, Depart from me into the fire, prepared for the devil, and his angels, because when I was hungry, you fed me not. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. How did they reply? When did we not do all these things? They had a great awareness of all the good they'd done. A substantial difference between the sheep. The sheep had no recognition that they had done anything good because everything they had done was actually God at work in them and they recognized this. And so there was no need to boast of their accomplishments. Substantial difference here. It, it's, it's, it's because of the deception of the devil, though, because we've been raised, just like you said, to 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 want to have the steering wheel in our own hand. Yeah. It's just it's it's pumped on television and media. This the last twenty years. Of yeah. It's just like you said. It goes directly against what the world is selling right now, as far as and Christianity. You feel like you don't have to, huh? Christianity buying into it too much. Yeah. Right? You feel like if you don't, there's the illusion that you need to have control. If, yeah. you, if you let go, everything's just going to go into the ditch. Right. Absolutely. 
It appears to me that the boasting, as you just mentioned, uh, falls in the same category as the complaining of the saints. I'm complaining about how much I'm complaining about how hard it is, how much work yes, it is, yes. how much I spend, and how all the great things I'm doing. And Do you think it matters which side you're on? Right? No, it's, whatever the effect is, the, the effect is the same. The result is basically the same. It's, it's a focus on man and a failure to see how gracious God has been in Jesus Christ. All right, something beautiful emerging now. Okay, oh, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, that when Jesus, he gave us very uh, good uh, experience when he was uh, up there, and when they had to condemn uh, Maria Magdalena, I'm sorry, my English is. That's fine. And then uh, she should be with stone for them, for yes. that. Yes. And what he said. Who was condemning her? Yeah, and who is clean or righteous, paper stone, so no one, because no one is, so he wanted to show us that. So. Right, absolutely, it's very good. Jesus taught this over and over again, didn't he? Yeah. In many ways. I heard a great statement, by the way, this week quoted from St. Francis of Assisi, a really great Christian, who wrote a number of great books. But he said, uh, preach the gospel <laughs> always and occasionally use words. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a profound statement that is. <laughs> we think that it's all words. <laughs> all right, in Romans 3 verses 19 and 28, he now opens up for the first time, and I want you to notice what he's doing coming back over here. What is he now going to enlarge fully upon? It's already been established in the theme. In moving into an understanding of justification, what is he now developing fully from the theme? I warned you he was going to do this. Yes, John, thank you. He's going to take the death of Jesus now and he's going to blow it wide open. Not the resurrection. He's going to take the death now and expand upon it and show you the great significance of the death of Jesus. And of course, the great word justification is about to emerge. And the root meaning of the word justification, who has it? The root meaning, we won't let John answer this, he has prior knowledge. <laughs> On the root meaning of the word justification, I want to see what school of thought you've all been buying into. The root meaning of the word justification. I'll tell you what I've heard. Made right with God. That's made right, okay. It doesn't mean made right. That would be closer to sanctification. Set right is okay, but it's not clear. Laurie Vendon uses that yeah. term. It's not a bad term, but I'm not sure it's a clear term. There is an even clearer term, Lynn. I'm looking at just the Greek word and its root meaning, if in case anyone knows it. Is it vindicate? So I'm just looking up here. You could say vindicate. It says clear and then. There's a, a better definition. Um, it's interesting that right is not the thing because the other three verses all use they become righteous is one. Right standing is that <coughs> the new American standard says justified. So I have to assume they're all translating this yeah. as righteous and right standing. So that's the way they're translating that Greek word in the others. Yeah. But there is something that hasn't emerged yet, right? I just element that doesn't go with it. It's very helpful what Dennis has shared here. Extremely helpful. Catherine? Uh, judged right. Judged right, okay. I mean, that could hold up too, yes. Accounted? Accounted is getting a lot clearer. The strongest, I think, the strongest that I've heard is declared, which is the same as accounted, uh, Karen. Declared, Dennis has helped us here. Righteous, yes. Declared righteous. Not 
made righteous, declared righteous. We're talking now of the imputed righteousness of Christ, where something apart from you is credited to you. You are the privilege to be declared righteous. And there's one word I don't want you to be hung up on here. You're going to come up against it in this passage. It's a big word. What is the word? Propitiation. What verse is that in? 23. Propitiation. 25. Propitiation. And I'll give you this word in advance before you come up against it. It's not a complicated word, interesting enough, because it basically means in the original, it's the word for, it's a sanctuary term, it actually means mercy seat. It's the word for mercy seat, sometimes uh, translated as sacrifice of atonement. But it's actually the mercy seat, and what two elements come together with the mercy seat? Sits upon? On the law. On the Ark of the Covenant containing the law. So the two elements of justice, justice and mercy are both present in propitiation. It's a magnificent word. A magnificent word. I'm just giving you that in advance so you can keep it in mind. Go ahead now. Verses 19 to 28. It's not complicated. Keep it simple. And I want you to outline the factors or the steps involved in justification. And there are several observations that he makes regarding justification. Please pull it together and make sure you have a summary of what's involved in justification. There'll be comments on man, there'll be comments on God, and there'll be comments on the process by which man and God come together. Please spell it out now. Spell it out. Don't miss anything. There's some repetition in the passage, and I want you to pull that together too. Pull your group close together. You've got the verses up there. What you're going to do now is summarize those verses and extract the big points out of them. To share with me the most profound insights into the meaning of justification and how a sinful human being obtains it. And having obtained it, what benefit they have. I need a simple, clear understanding of what this blessing is, how it's obtained, and what results once you've got it. And maybe it would also be useful to know how it is not obtained. He spells that out too, quite clearly. So whatever needs to be understood about justification and its meaning, you will now be accountable for once you've finished working through this passage. That's why you've got to dig it out. Don't take it for granted. And that's why the key word in the whole passage is propitiation. In which justice and mercy meet. It's a unique term. The meaning of justification, you've got the cart before the horse. You must come to an understanding of what Paul is saying here about justification what it is and how you obtain it and what the benefits are. This means you've got to hear this whole passage as a unit. And if you've zeroed in and you're trying to wrestle through forgiveness and you haven't got the big picture yet clear, that's putting the cart before the horse. Paul, some of you have managed to make it even more complex. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> 
Uh, we're not going to get a chance to finish it tonight, but I just wanted you to look in simple terms at some things that are emerging out of this passage, because in it, Paul describes the true situation of man and the dilemma that God faces with the knowledge that man is in this condition and the solution that God moves into. And it's a very beautiful solution. Just giving me the scriptures now from that passage, what is man's situation? Alright, so man has sinned. <coughs> And he's fallen short of the glory of God. Absolutely. That's stated quite clear and clear. This is man. There's more. Still in just the verses that you were looking at. Anything else regarding man's... Those of you that are writing, please repent and get into the Word now. What else is there in that passage describing man's situation? Just in verses 19 to 28. Come on, I want scripture now. Verse 20. Verse 20, what do you want to tell me? Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So man cannot. Cannot. Work. The law. The work of the law. Cannot do the work of the law. Okay? Himself. Very important to see this. So here we have an interesting situation. Man has sinned. He's fallen short of God's glory. He cannot keep the law in order to bring about any kind of change. He has violated, it's implied, that he's violated God's law. Hell? Uh, man is guilty before God. Where are you reading from? From the verse 19, the last part of it. I want to hear the words. Okay. Paul's and, words on And all the world may become guilty before God. Is that what your version says? Mm -hmm. All the world may become guilty before God. Yeah, the modern versions say accountable. Okay. That's, uh, guilty. So man is guilty or accountable. Absolutely. I hope you see the picture that he's painting here. This is the situation that man has got himself into. Through sin, he sinned, he's fallen short of God's glory, he can't bring about a change himself because he's no longer capable of keeping the law of God, and he is guilty of accountable to God. In other words, it's not that he's made a mistake and too bad, he is actually in a position of accountability to God. Anything we've missed out, Teresa? Um, the <coughs> okay, so he's aware. Very good, Teresa. Man is aware of his condition through the law. The very law that he'd like to keep only serves to convict him of his sinfulness. And the harder he tries to keep it, the more convicted he becomes that it's hopeless. Very good, Teresa. Excellent. Man is aware of his condition. And the instrument of help that he sees only serves to keep him under. It doesn't help him to rise above his condition. Have we left anything out? It's very important to see this. This is all the picture. This is why I said the big picture here. This is the picture that Paul is painting. Have we missed anything? Anyone sitting on another gem out there? Alright, so we, we could say uh, man has nothing to boast about, right? Nothing to boast. In other words, Teresa, what it's really saying is man has nothing to boast about. 
to offer God as even partial payment for his condition because he has nothing to boast but Teresa's getting into the word here. Praise the Lord. You heard the body get excited, didn't you, Teresa? We have a living body here. Every now and again they groan inwardly. Yes, yes. Well, in the back half of 22, the end there, where there is no distinction as it leads into all of sin. So there is no distinction as far as God. There's whether all of all. I should have emphasized that they all are in this boat together. Please allow this, this is the, the big picture now, allow it. And I'm doing this really to show you how you tackle a passage in Paul. You allow yourself to hear the scenario that he's painting. And all the way through this passage he keeps throwing it out. This is the condition that man is in. It's hopeless, he can't change himself. And the very instrument of deliverance that he thinks will help him only serve to condemn him and push him deeper into the hole. And the final result is he's fallen way short of the glory of God. And scary, scary thought he's actually a coward. There is accountability even though we did not choose to be in this condition. Apparently we have a choice to be out of it. That's why there is accountability. If we had no choice in the matter, there would hardly be accountability. But God in His mercy is offering a way out of this mess. That's why there's accountability. Remember, it says help responsible. Help responsible. But did, did you catch what I just said? If there was no choice, God could hardly hold you responsible. It shows, say that again, Joe. Beautiful statement there. It shows his justice. Because God has offered mankind a choice, a way out of this mess, God can justly hold man accountable. Whereas if there was no way out, it would not be just for God to hold us accountable because we did not bring this on ourselves. In fact, the thing I love best about God is that he, who was the great American president that said the buck stops here? Who said that? Truman. Yeah, well, God says the same thing. God has said, according to sin, it fascinates me that God would do this. He's not blaming the devil. God says the buck stops here. I created Lucifer. I accept the responsibility for what sin has done. I didn't cause it, but I'm accepting the responsibility and I will provide a way of escape. And I can justly hold man accountable because man does not have to spend his life as a slave to sin. I want to tell you, that is good news. Yes. Yes. Very good news. That's what makes this, this is probably the most profound passage in the whole book of Romans. I'm serious. Because if you get Romans 3 clear, you say it in, in Romans 1. But you've got to hear it. Then. We don't want you to have a wilderness experience. Keep reminding yourself that Paul is ever so logic. So what is God's dilemma? On scripture now, don't gaze up into heaven. sin man still has to make the choice. Is that part of the rule? Well, I want scripture. Come on. Give me Paul's it's, word. Well, well, what it what says verse it, do you it says in 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did, did this to demonstrate his justice. This was probably part of God's response to the dilemma, Helen. But I mean, I appreciate what you're doing. Keep looking in there, brother, because I, I want a verse that summarizes 
the dilemma that God was facing. Nick, have you got something? In 26 it says that he might be just ah. and the justifier ah. of the one who ah. has faith. God's dilemma be just. is how <laughs> to remain, like you say, just, while at the same time do what? Justify Yes, thank you. To justify sinners, sinful human beings who have fallen short of his glory, who love sin, who are corrupt by nature, who can't even seek out God. God, who is a just being, now has to justify sinners because his great heart of love will not let them go. Well, this is an incredible passage. How to be both just and the justifier of this. And remember what God's about to do. He's going to declare those who have fallen short of His glory, corrupted by sin, born in iniquity, dwarfed, through inheritance, <laughs> genetically stunted, God is looking for a way of declaring that righteous. And he wants to remain just as he does it. So that there will never be a question ever again about his integrity and he can safely maintain his kingdom based on the principles that we know represent his character. This incredible thing. How to remain just and yet do the unthinkable. I do believe we're getting a glimpse here into the very heart of God Himself. And just picture God looking down at His magnificent creation. Can you catch a hearing groaning inwardly? In fact, there's one of the most awful verses in the Bible that says at the time of Noah, God repented that He'd even made man. Wow. He repented, but. Even in Noah's day, there was a way of escape. And interestingly enough, it was through an ark. And I want to tell you, it's through an ark today, too.
and yet at the same time do the unthinkable. Allow his mercy to prevail, despite the fact that in order to do that, he would have to justify those who were enslaved by sin and whose very unholiness was an antithesis to his own character. An amazing situation God has. And in order to bring it about, he came up with a most incredible solution. A solution on one hand that retained his integrity, while on the other hand offered to those who'd been warped by sin the privilege of regaining what they'd lost through sin. Incredible solution. And in the process, the most convicting picture of God will emerge. By Jesus' death, he stood in our place, and then by his life, he stood in our place. Well, just hold that until we see where Paul goes with this, huh? Yeah, he does, Lily. You're right. Yep. Fully. In God's solution, he's made total provision for our complete restoration. So, very exciting. It's a shame to cut off at this point, but you've got much to chew on. It'll keep you alive and well until we meet again tomorrow afternoon. Let's bow our heads together as we conclude. Roy, could I call on you tonight to close the prayer? Thank you. Our Father in heaven, we have opened the heavens tonight, and we have found the blessing here. Thank you for each one of us. We pray that we will continue to open our hearts and may the Holy Spirit come to our lives as we listen and contemplate on your word and your salvation mm-hmm. and your justification. Yeah. And the means that you have called us back to you. So tonight we go home with a light heart and an open mind and bring us back safely tomorrow for to learn more at your feet. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.